complex systems. In 1827, Scottish botanist Robert Brown discovered what later came to be known as Brownian motion. Looking through a microscope, he noticed that tiny pollen grains suspended in water moved in an erratic, jittery way. At first, he thought this motion was due to some life force, but later he confirmed that even inorganic particles exhibited the same behavior. It wasn't until 1896 that the father of statistical physics, Ludwig Edward Boltzmann, postulated the true reason behind this movement when he wrote Movements were observed in very small particles located in a gas which may be due to the fact that, in such cases, a pressure that is no longer negligible in relation to their entire surface may fluctuate. However, the mathematical explanation for this mysterious movement came nearly 80 years later, in 1905, when Albert Einstein published a groundbreaking paper. He proposed that the random motion of the particles was caused by countless collisions with much smaller invisible molecules of the liquid. This idea served as a confirmation of the atomic nature of matter, a hypothesis that was still controverted in the late 19th century. Indeed, William Oswald, one of the last holdouts against atomic theory, claimed he had been converted to atomistics by the complete explanation of Brownian motion. It was a crucial step in modern physics. But before we dive deeper into the details of Einstein's derivation, I want to show you first how the actual Brownian motion looks like in a real experiment. This is Brownian motion on its prime. What you are seeing are silica particles of an approximate diameter of 1 micron, dispersed on water. They are observed through a microscope that can resolve particles of a size as small as 200 nanometers. This particular video is courtesy of our colleague Raúl Rica from the Nanotechnology Lab of the University of Granada. Now, what can we learn from this experiment? Suppose that we track the position of one of these tiny particles relative to its starting point and plot that position over time. We would get a graph like this one. If we then repeat the process many times, we end up with an ensemble of distant trajectories. Remarkably, if we average all of these trajectories, the resulting average path shows no net motion at all. However, if we instead compute the square displacement for each particle and average those values, we find that the mean square displacement increases linearly with time. Fascinating, isn't it? Now, let us see how these observations emerge from Einstein's mathematical derivation. Now that we have visualized what Brownian motion looks like with a real-life experiment, we can model it mathematically, just like Einstein did back in 1905. The first thing that we want to do is to tackle this problem from a probabilistic point of view. Indeed, if we repeat the previous experiment many times, we will find out that the red ball will follow a different trajectory every time. This happens because this simple system is subject to some degree of stochasticity, making it unpredictable. Hence, instead of focusing on what the red particle is doing, we want to understand how the probability to find it at a certain position, x, y, changes in time. Now, let me pause the video for a second and warn you that what comes now might be a little too technical. You can just skip the math and forward this video around 5.5 minutes to get back to the fun part again. Math intensity level extreme, proceed with caution, side effects may include mind-blowing equations, sudden existential crisis and the urge to prove the Riemann hypothesis. Now, we can divide our trajectory in small steps of duration tau. At each step, the particle will move a tiny amount, delta x, delta y. Let us start by writing down the continuity equation that expresses that the probability to find the particle at x, y at time t plus tau must be the sum of the probabilities that the particle was at x minus delta x and y minus delta y 
times the probability that it jumped in the direction delta x, delta y, summed over all possible jumps. We will denote the probability distribution of the jumps as p sub j. Since the number of possible jumps is continuous, this sum must be replaced by an integral. Now, we can perform a Taylor expansion on both sides, one of them on terms of tau and the other on terms of delta x, delta y, the size of the jump. Let us now multiply by the distribution of jumps and integrate over all possible jumps on both sides of this expression. This seemingly terrible equation can be simplified just by taking into account the definition of the expected value of the function g, which is the integral of that function weighted by the probability distribution. Coming back to our previous expression, we can recognize some expected values that can be easily calculated. First, the expected value of the constant function 1, which is 1 due to the normalization of the probability distribution. Then, the expected values of the jumps, which are 0. In order to understand why these terms are 0, let us get back to the wiggling particle for a second. In this plot, I am showing you, on the left, the position of the particle subject to Brownian motion. On the right, I am plotting all the jumps that the particle does at its time step of size tau. As we can see, after a long time, the distribution of jumps or white dots is symmetrical with respect to the origin. This mathematical statement just means that there are as many jumps in one direction as many in the opposite. Thus, the expected value of the jump in its direction must be zero as it is equally likely to jump in the direction delta x, delta y, than it is to jump in the opposite one. If I haven't yet convinced you, take a look at how the Brownian motion would look like if the expected value of the jumps in the x direction was 1. This means that in general, the particle would tend to move to the right, as we can see on the left plot. Now, compare this with our original experiment. They don't look alike, right? Well, this is nature telling us that this particular interaction must be isotropic, which is a fancy word for saying symmetric in every direction. Let us get back to our equations now. We can keep applying our definition of expected values to get the standard deviation of the jumps in the direction of x, the correlation between jumps in each dimension, and the standard deviation of jumps in the direction of y. Now, let me convince you that the first and last terms are the same one, and that the second term must be zero. For that, let us get back to our previous simulation. If we make the correlation non-zero, we are basically saying that every time you jump towards positive x, you tend to also jump towards positive i. That is sort of the meaning behind the correlation, and vice versa. In particular, this would again break the symmetry of the problem, and we would not get something similar to the true experiment. The same thing happens if we make the standard deviation of jumps in one direction, say x, bigger than in the other. This will mean that it's more likely to make big jumps in the direction of x, and it is less likely to make it in the direction of y, again breaking the isotropic properties that we are holding to. With all of these considerations, our equation finally turns into this one right here, where k is nothing but the standard deviation of the size of the jumps. Now, plugging all of these expansions into the continuity equation, and after cancelling some terms out, we arrive at the final equation, which can be written in terms of the diffusion constant d and the Laplace operator Napla. Alright, congratulations! <laughs> you have now exited the hardcore math zone. Achievement unlocked, casual math enjoyer. We may now continue with the cool stuff. This equation is known as the diffusion equation. The solution to the diffusion equation is the Gaussian distribution. This means that, as time progresses, the probability of finding the particle far from its starting point increases. 
In average, the particle stays on the same place, but its position carries more uncertainty as time goes by, because the standard deviation increases linearly with time as 6 times the diffusion constant times t. This simulation can help you visualize what is happening. On the main plot, we have a bunch of particles subject to Brownian motion, all of them starting at the same initial condition, the origin. As time goes by, they tend to diffuse in every direction. If we look at the histogram of positions at any time, in X or in Y, we get the Gaussian distribution, with a width that is bigger as time goes by. This is what the probability density looks like in three dimensions. Again, as you can see, as we move forward in time, the probability density becomes flatter, and the probability to find the particle far away from the origin becomes bigger. The diffusion equation beautifully connects microscopic randomness to macroscopic smooth behavior, bridging stochastic processes and classical physics. Now, Einstein was not the only one that helped understand the physical foundation of Brownian motion. In 1908, French physicist Paul Langevin gave an analogous mathematical description of Brownian motion. His approach remains quite popular to this day, because it was one of the precursors of modern stochastic calculus. Instead of looking at the probability density of all the possible trajectories of Brownian motion as Einstein did, Langevin focused on how the particle's position changes over time. He assumed that the particle was subject to two different forces. Friction, which he modeled as Stokes' law, together with the fluctuating force, T of T, product of these tiny random forces that the microscopic particles in the fluid exert on the pollen grains or the red ball in our cool simulation. Using these assumptions, one can write Newton's second law, governing the position of the particle. Now, I will leave it to you as an exercise to derive the expression of the evolution in time of the second moment of the position of the particle. For that, here are some hints. First, multiply both sides of the equation by x. Then, take averages on both sides. Now, use the isotropic properties of the problem to simplify the expression. How do these properties translate to the statistical features of the fluctuating force T of T? Finally, assume thermal equilibrium and use the equipartition theorem to get to this final equation right here. Observe that this equation is compatible with Einstein's diffusion law as long as the diffusion constant has this expression over here. The main difference between Einstein's approach and Langevin's one is that the later focused on individual trajectories of the Brownian particle out of the statistical ensemble of all the possible ones. On the other hand, Einstein focused not on the particular trajectory but rather on the probability of that trajectory. Langevin laid the basis for stochastic calculus, a powerful tool to analyze dynamical systems whose evolution is subject to some random forces, just like t of t in our example. Leave me a comment if you would like to know more about stochastic calculus.